Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for coming back to the podcast. My special guest today is Miss Sinead Leopard, who is an Irish dance judge with On Kogal in Derry, Ireland. Sinead, good to have you on. Lovely to see you and meet you again, Richard. Thank you. Absolutely. So I was recently uh, perusing Facebook as we do, and I saw some pictures you had posted some from uh, some Irish dancing from years go uh, gone by. And I thought, you know, she's probably got a lot of memories and a lot of good experiences. I think our audience would appreciate and may be able to relate to. So I wanted to have you on and you graciously agreed to come on, which I appreciate very much. So to get those memories started, let's start from a little bit of your history. Walk, uh, walk and talk us back in your Irish dance past. How did you get started? Who were your teachers? Well, the Irish dancing has been running in our family for a long time. Uh, my mother was one of 13 children and seven of them danced. They were a very famous dancing family in Derry, the McLaughlin family. So as soon as we could walk, we were sent to dancing. And of course, we're, there was no no such thing as I'm not going. You were sent to dancing. But <laughs> we, were, we were very lucky in that it was my aunt who was our dancing teacher. Okay. Yeah. And my aunt is the late Miss Mary McLaughlin, who is a founder member of Uncogoy. Okay. Yeah. So we are steeped in the history of Uncogoy and <laughs> dancing and she had a very famous school, well, well known. And her team dancing was just out of this world. It was unbelievable. We had the best, I could say one of the best teachers. Okay. So um, we were all sent to dancing. There, I am the eldest of eight children. The five girls all danced, but my father wouldn't let the boys dance at all. He oh. says, no. No, there's enough with five girls rattling their feet about the houses <laughs> and the boys aren't going. And you've got to remember too, Richard, like I went to dancing in the 70s, 80s. We went to dancing during the, the height of the Troubles in Derry. Oh, okay. And so we were all sent to something to try and keep us off the streets. The boys were sent to like the scouts. So we were all sent to dancing. And this was the 70s, so this was just after the split as okay. well, you know, in the organization. So um, we really had no competitions up here, and the troubles didn't help either. So we had to get um, bus to Lake Dublin to the Father Matthew Fish, and uh, that was the only place we had to travel, because Mary was on her own here. She stood on her own with Uncle Goyle, and she built up. Basically, the Derry Donegal branch that exists now today. We've almost 60 teachers. And um, the the majority of the teachers were, were pupils of Mount Mary's or pupils of the pupils, you know. So uh, we're steeped in history and dancing. And I right. dance. My sister's actually adjudicating the figure dancing now at the world <laughs> this weekend. Okay. Yes, and then there's two other girls are qualified teachers as well. My son's a qualified teacher as well and a face musician. Oh, okay. so we're we're very steeped in the Irish dancing world. Yeah, absolutely. So where do we start? Wow, I mean, just those two things or a couple of things you mentioned there alone uh, could be could go on for hours. But I guess to get sort of a general synopsis of it all, you talked about. Uh, dancing during the times of the troubles in Ireland. Now I've had someone else on my podcast before mention dancing during that time. And you had to be careful where you walked and you had to be careful how you dressed and all that kind of stuff. What do you remember having to do differently during that time than maybe you didn't have to do before those, those, uh, the environment was that way. Yeah. Well, uh, Mary taught up in the center of the town and up in St. Columns Hall, which is in the town center. So um, we got the bus up to Danson, uh, got off at the bus station, but you had to walk through, you had to go through a checkpoint, a soldier's checkpoint. So it was like turnstiles and the army were there. And like I was seven, eight at the time. So you're going through, you're getting off a bus yourself and you're going through a turnstile and every bag was searched. So like you were handing over your dancing shoes, searched. And they had to wait until there was a female soldier to be able to come and frisk you. Right. 
Right. But this 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 just became the norm for us. They actually they actually got to recognize the same ones going to the dancing class and coming back from the dancing class. But it's what sort of kept us going during those times. You know, it was your dancing and it was uh, a routine. Every Wednesday, every Friday, it was dancing. You know, and it it just and then you traveled to Fascia and you had to travel. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's that's what just kept us going. And how those teachers kept going during those times, mm-hmm. it was very difficult, but they managed. They did. They right. were very passionate. Okay. Now, Sinead, to the best of your your memory, do you? Do you recall there not being feshes during that time in the north of Ireland, at least where you were at in the north of Ireland? Did you have to go into the, I guess, the Republic, as we would call it here, like Ireland mainland, as it were, to do competitions? Yes, yes, Richard. For a while after the split, you see, you have to remember we had the split with right. the commission. And so as Mary stood herself with Coco, there were no other teachers. So we basically had to travel because we had no competition. And then it, uh, she, my aunt had to rely on a lot of parents. There was a lot of good parents helped to organize the competitions in the north. Then and people from Dublin, people from Galway, they traveled up to support us to support Cogoil, you know, in the northwest, and it and it helped to build it up. It's it's very strong here now at the moment. Right, I understand. Yeah, from posts and just from talking to people, I understand it's very strong up there now. Uh, Sinead, who was Mary's teacher? Where did she learn Irish dancing? Mary learned actually was uh, the late Brendan Diglin. Okay. Yeah, that was Mary's teacher. And her brothers and sisters also learned with Mr. Diglin. And uh, then when Mary got her exam, uh, the mother, her mother wanted to take all the, the dancers to Mary because she says it wasn't sort of practical to have them at a different school. And I had two uncles that were very good dancers, Mary's brothers, Dan and Con. And he, he basically said to Mary, uh, or to my granny, you can uh, take the girls, but can I please keep the two boys? <laughs> 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 and she, she was, no, she says, can't have them in two different schools. They all have to go. You know, so I almost did a glam her. Okay. Yeah. Now, if you could uh, describe your aunt's style of dancing and then how she related that to you, how would you describe her style of dancing and teaching in her choreography? Uh, her, she was very much richer than the rhythm. Mm-hmm. It was a very natural style of dancing, but rhythm and timing was her. She was very particular about, she would have been teaching us and we speak the steps Mm -hmm. When we're teaching, we have to speak them. And what you're saying, the words have to come from your feet. And I remember many a time in the class, Mary would say you were up doing your set dance. And she would go outside the door. Now, I'm just going to say, but she had to hear every beat from your feet. If you missed something, the head came back in the door again. And it was, (laughs) I hear that. You missed that, you know. She says, your feet have to speak. And that has been drummed into us. Like, even now when I'm adjudicating, I'm very much in the rhythm and your timing. My head, my feet, everything is going. If I get somebody that the music's coming from their feet, I'm just in heaven when I'm adjudicating. Mm. And that all has has come from from Mary and Mm. her teaching. Would you describe that style, just to to further develop this, a short conversation on her her style obviously it was very rhythmic but let's say in the soft shoes would it be an aggressive style a graceful style an agilic style or was it be low to the ground no it wasn't aggressive she had no time now for being aggressive it was graceful but but had plenty of lift at the same time but there was no aggressive. Oh, she would have just pulled you up straight away. Now, if you were coming across as being aggressive, mm-hmm. she was always say, "There's more dancers in that floor now than you." You know. Right. Oh no, she no time for that. So we've carried that three. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
And I ask that because I've had people tell me in the past who have done, who had been involved with in Irish dancing for many years, they would say when describing the styles of different parts of Ireland, they would say, well, the, the north of Ireland would be known as more of the of a balletic soft shoe style. And I think what they meant by that was more elevated through the toes, maybe a little more lift. I'm not sure, yeah. but maybe you can speak to that. I have never actually noticed any difference. And I, I know a lot of the schools now here, especially in Derry. Now, even Belfast would kind of have a different style of dancing from us. Mm. But it's more into rhythm I, and possibly in the lift, there would be more attack and more energetic in the light and the soft shoes, you would say, dancing, mm. you know. What are some of your memories? If you look back now, and I'm sure you probably reflect on this all the time, looking back at your, your formative years, maybe the first few years that you were in Irish dancing as a child, what are some of the things that stick out to you? Like some of the memories that you just carry to you, carry with you to this day? The, the fun, the friendship, now that we had, you know, there's, there's people that was in our dancing class now, and I'm friends with them now for over 50 years. And some of them are dance teachers as well. And we still do sort of laugh, you know, at the things, some of the things that happened in the class. You know, funny wee things, because Mary, as I said, taught in St. Columns Hall. Mm -hmm. And there was there was one one day we were in the class and, and all of a sudden these younger ones started to like, fall asleep. They were lying across the benches and <laughs> it was getting, and the, it was all right, maybe one child. And I remember now we laugh now when we think back on it, there was actually a, a gas leak in the building. Oh. And, the, <laughs> and of course, Mary, Mary, Mary never had any children, but she was very much a mother figure to everybody. And I'll never forget her reaction and how protective she was of us all, you know, to get us out. You know, she thought, oh, this wee child here oh, must have had a hard day at school today and she's tired. But then the next one started to lie down. <laughs> and everybody, you know, when you think back to sometimes some of the, the teachers now, we would get together and think back on some of the things, you know. And another great uh, memory is dancing in the Late Late Show. Okay. Um, yeah, we were taken. Uh, I remember I was 18 years of age and it was a show all about Derry. And uh, it was one of Mary's composed dances. We were dancing the Celtic Cross. And the fun we had at that, we were, and we thought we were brilliant. We were put up in Jerry's Hotel. Okay. And one of the, one of the great choirs from the city was on the bus with us. And they were put, they were put up in a a lesser hotel, so they weren't pleased at this. <laughs> but we were in Jerry's Hotel at St Patrick's weekend, and there was American bands over for the parade, and we still laugh at that. You know that uh, like we were eighteen, so we were allowed in the bar, and there was all these Americans over for the St Patrick's Day parade, and we just thought we were in absolute heaven. <laughs> you know, we think back now and you go, God, you know, they were great days. They really were great days, you know. But Mary's team was just her choreography and that dance was oh, out of this world, right? You could actually see the movements telling the story, you know, of the Celtic cross and it coming back together again. But it was, it was with great memories. That's what I remember of dancing. Okay. And that's what I would like to think that now as a teacher is what I pass on to the children. It's the enjoyment, the teamwork, do you know, stuff like that. If you're not enjoying it, it's time to get out of it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's all about enjoyment and friendship and stuff. Have you ever I, found the time where you didn't enjoy it as much? I, no, I always enjoyed my dancing. Maybe in the last few years, um, you know, say you're defending a title and you, but it wasn't anybody else was putting pressure on you. You were putting the pressure on yourself. And I just thought near the time, I, was, I remember the last Ulster Championships. And I think, I think Mary could see that I was getting a bit anxious and it was myself was doing it to myself. <laughs> like it wasn't any pressure from Mary. And she just, she just said, no, that's it, Sinead. 
just you take a year out now, you'll be doing your exam next year. And she wouldn't enter me, so she made me take she made me take the year out. And I remember it was another dancer in the school won the championship, and I was thinking, oh well, <laughs> you know. But she as well, you know, it was of the belief if you're not enjoying it, it's time to take a step back. Right. Do you think that she was right in in going in there and being assertive and sort of making that decision for you? Yes. I do. I do think she was right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Because I could, I could feel the stress. You know, I, I was, I could feel it coming on myself, and I just thought, no, I'm not doing this one night, and I'm doing my exam in a few months' time, and that was it. Mm -hmm. You know. It's. Mm -hmm. I know you've been teaching a long time. Uh, I know just in the time I've been teaching, it seems like, um, and and you can elaborate on this if you will. <clears throat> Teachers like your aunt would have taken more of a role in directing the student where they think they need to go with competitions, performances, maybe it's time to sit your, your teacher's exam or whatever. It seems like a lot of times nowadays, the parents drive a lot of the direction, maybe a little bit more than the teachers might want them to. Talk about how you've seen the differences between uh, the involvement with teachers then and the, te and the balance that they have to strike now with parents who may have other ideas. Yeah, well, I remember like back when we were at dancing and Mary was our teacher, the parents, the parents had a lot of respect for the teacher. What Mary said was gospel, Richard, that was it. If she says no, well, they didn't argue or, you know, the child's not fit for that step. It's too advanced. Let them come at their own pace. They took Mary's word for it. Mary knows best. I find now... Not so much in my own class, but I find some teachers get themselves put under pressure because parents, I think, want more for their children now, you know, and um, they sort of want more from the teacher. Right. They expect more. Now, I mean, you can only teach a child to the best of its ability. Yeah, and... I always feel you teach a child, you work with a child. There's nothing more I enjoy more than a child learning a step and getting up to master that and get on a stage. And you're teaching them more things, preparing them for everyday life, not just the stage. But some parents, I, I see in some schools, they put a lot of pressure on the teacher. Mm -hmm. But then it's up to the teacher to take the stand. I mean, it's their class. Right. Yeah. And you can only teach the child. It's up to the child to go home then and work. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't do the work for them. You teach them, you help them, you advise them as much as you can. You know, but I do see a difference. Now, some teachers wouldn't be as strong and take a lot of pressure from parents. Mm -hmm. Where in Mary's day, it was just, no, oh, there's the door. Right. I remember she always said, and it's something I would always say in my own class, my door swings both ways. You can go back out the same way as you came in. And that was always Mary's words. <laughs> you know, away you go. If I'm not good enough, there's plenty of others out there. You yeah. know, so no, nobody would have ever argued with her. Right. But there's a big difference now. I think younger parents coming through you know, ex sort of expect. Now it's got more expensive now too, Richard, you know, so people are out a lot of money now, which is understandable, you That's know? true. And that yeah. shows a lot of confidence on on her part. And of course, other teachers have done have, have had that firm stance as well. Yeah. And these days, it seems like a lot of Irish dance teachers are doing this. This is their career. This is what they do. They don't do, they don't work any other job. And over... Yeah probably the 150, I think you might make the 154th or 55th interview I've done. And just collectively thinking about all this, a lot of people who teach full time tend to be uh, a little more flexible with parents where teachers who don't teach full time, where they have that other career they go to may have, may not be as flexible in a way. Uh, I may be characterizing that a little bit wrong, but I just, I just seem like I pick up that, that sentiment with them. It's like, if yeah. you're doing this for a living, you don't want to do anything to run off a customer. But if you're not worried about it, you, you tend to not, yeah. you know, you don't, you're not, you're not under that pressure. Yeah, you're not. Yeah. I would agree with you there now. 
So well, there's a lot of teachers, I find, if that's their main job, they don't want to lose anybody. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, when, when did you know, Sinead, it was time to, to hang up the competitive shoes, as it were, student shoes, and become a teacher? Well, I, I just think I always had it in my head that, you know, once you're 21, you can do your exam. Mm-hmm. And there was a group of us in the class who were all at school together, went to dancing together, and we all went and did our exam together. So okay. you just came that you got your 21st birthday, you applied to Uncle Google, and we all went down to Dublin together and sat our exam. Mm. You know, so we were all able to work together. And I think that year, Mary had about three or four of us qualified teachers. I think now at this stage, she must she must have. <laughs> I think, it, well, there's 60 teachers now, Brian, so I wouldn't like to think how many qualified teachers Mary had <laughs> through yeah. the years. Mm. Right. You know, and there are a lot of teachers that have that same background that you're describing where they compete, it, they do a little show for a while, or maybe they don't. But whenever they're done competing, they're getting ready for what's next with their dancing, or they may hang it up. They may say that's just not for them anymore. But then you have some teachers, I would probably put myself in this category, that didn't go straight from competing to right into uh, a system to get certified and, and start teaching. Before they started teaching, I opened up classes, uh, you know, shortly after I retired and, you know, worked towards an exam and, and all that kind of stuff. But it, that came later. And I found that I, I've sort of discovered that a lot of people in Ireland do that track you're talking about, but maybe in other parts of the world, they do it. The, the certification comes way after they've been teaching. Have you noticed the same thing? I haven't noticed that. Now, everybody in Ireland, it, the, I find the oldest, even from teaching dancers and putting them through their teacher's exam themselves, if they, if they go to u- university and do their degree, and then they'll come back to dance and to do their exam, well, they're normally around the 25, 26 when they're grad, no, when they've got their qualification. Mm-hmm. I have never come across anybody later in life going back to do their exam. I think it's hard enough. I think it's hard enough going back to do your adjudicator's exam and do all that dancing over again. Yeah. <laughs> You know, because like you, you have to be 10 years a qualified teacher before you can go back and dance all your set dances again. Right. You know? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I, I'm the odd duck. I'm the odd one out. I'll, I'll freely admit that. But, you know, sometimes it takes a little longer to find what you're really looking for. That's how I, I'll, I'll say it that way. I found what I was looking for. It just took me a little bit longer than maybe some other people did. <laughs> You just went the scenic route, Richard. I have a lot of experience. There we go. <laughs> but uh, no, it's good. And I, I, I've enjoyed it. it. You know, it's nothing wrong with having goals, especially when you get older. And I've, I've certainly got some goals. Um, and I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot about an organization I didn't know much about. You know, when I was, I'll share, like, I, sh- I will share a quick little anecdote. Uh, when I was taking classes, years ago, 20 something years ago, I had heard about other organizations besides commission, which I was, a, I was a dancer under. And I would ask my teacher about them and they would say, Oh yeah, well this organization they do, they don't really talk much about them, you know? And it, and what they said wasn't necessarily bad, but it wasn't like, Oh, they're the same as we are. We had a similar history. They didn't ever talk about that, even though this teacher in particular would have known all about that. And I think that's a shame because they're, there's, these podcasts for me have fleshed out so much history that, that a lot of people, if you're not in it, you wouldn't know, you wouldn't know that the history of all these other, these people that you may or may not have heard about before and how they're part of the fabric of Irish dancing. So I think it's been fascinating to realize there's a really big Irish dance world out there that a lot of people, unfortunately are never told much about. Yeah. Well, it's a one big happy family. Richard, there's a lot of connections and all the organizations. And I think on Coco, especially, is very like family oriented. It's families like where we had my Auntie Mary. Then there's, um, she never had any children herself, but there, 
four nieces of us qualified. She's a nephew qualified. Then the next generation, there's qualified teachers. And it's just every generation, there's ones just going down the line and doing their their teacher's exam. Mm-hmm. Just right. carrying it through. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Did you find when you went to start your own classes? Well, first off, two parts to this question. One, did you start off completely on your own or did you stay dancing with, with family? And second part of that question would be, if you did start on your own, doing your own thing, what were the challenges you faced those early years becoming a teacher? Well, I actually did start teaching as McLaughlin School. Okay. But I didn't go into the class with Mary. Mary taught in the city. Uh, If, okay, she wasn't well or that, I would have went in and helped. But as I says, I went out of the city to teach I went out to the country areas and uh, I found the children from out there were actually more appreciative of what you actually did for them. In the city, they have more opportunities. They expected more of you. There was more competition. And um, like when I went out at the, at the start, I was 21, 20, 22 and I was teaching and if you said to them you were get, trying to get them ready for a fish it was like what's a fish mm. no do we have to go you know I go well you know but it would be nice you know and it would help your confidence to get on the stage and it was completely different I found that challenging to try and get them to come to compete mm-hmm. you know some of them just wanted to go just to learn to dance. Right. Yeah. So I didn't really have the pushy parents or the pressure, which was just right up my street. It was just, it was great. Mm-hmm. And it was enjoyable. And when right. they did go to fish and they would appreciate everything that you did for them. Okay. How many fishes would you have had back then to offer students in that, in your general area? Back then, when I started, well, possibly maybe six or eight in the year. Okay. That's, that sounds you like know. a good number to me. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes. And that was back then, Richard. And now we try and have, like, the branch would possibly have one every month or every other month. But then there's so many branches, like half an hour up the road and we're we've another several branches so we have a fish every weekend if you want to go to it my goodness there, there could be two fishes a weekend some might dance on a saturday and then travel somewhere else and dance on a sunday <laughs> uh, my, my weekends are precious <laughs> oh, wow. that's crazy yeah. i mean oh, there... a lot of, lot yeah. of competition here yeah mm-hmm. it's like that in america not not with Kogal yet. I think it, it you know, we'll, we're adding more competitions all the time. But with with commission, for instance, I mean, the East Coast or even parts of of what we call like Mid America, Chicago, right up in the middle, they'll have feshes every weekend, back to back feshes. Right. I've heard of that coming up over the years, and I, we could imagine that we would have had maybe three or four feshes. Well, when I was competing early on, we had let's see, we had two. That's all we had two. In the year. Yeah, in the year. And and that would be, and Texas is huge. Texas is, you could yeah. put, I think, four Irelands in Texas. So <laughs> it's a lot of area. But yeah. now there's there's probably five or six commission fashions, of course. But uh, yeah. yeah, so it's been slow growing. So it's interesting to hear that, that you had that much availability. Yeah. And, and like when you think back then, that was 87, I qualified for my teacher's exam. But 10, 15 years before that was during the Troubles and, and we had to travel to competitions, mm-hmm. Do you know. So it just went from one extreme to the other. You no, know, it just built up and because it was great parental support, you know, to help the few teachers. And now it's every branch is a big branch here now. We have right. a lot of teachers, a lot of teachers. And at what point did you decide to sit your ADCRG? Um, well, normally you can do it after 10 years teaching, mm-hmm. and, uh, but I just had two children. Mm-hmm. 
So I had it with you, happy children, and got because like with with us, we have to go back and dance again. Yes. You know, that's it's not an easy thing when you're sort of like 33 years of age, two <laughs> children, two children later, and trying to get yourself fit again. So um I had my two boys, and then I thought, right. And I remember my Auntie Meg because she was an examiner as well. So you don't go down to do your exam half prepared. You right. have to be, you know, it's like, and I, I went actually back up to the dancing class to her because I knew I wouldn't do it myself. So I had to go back up at 33 years of age for her to shout at me. <laughs> <laughs> and I got my dancing done, the first part done, and all my set dances and grand. And I actually did my second part of my exam the following year, and I graduated in August, and my third son was born in October. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I just got the exam in right here. I just put it in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what what did you find the most difficult part of, of that particular exam? Was it just getting the fitness back up, or were there other parts of it that you find hard? Yeah, I think no, it was the, the fitness because when I was when we were dancing when we were younger, we were so fit and it was trying to get your rhythm to sound the same as it did when you were 21. And I always remember when we were dancing, you had to work your back foot. Mary, Mary was a wild one for this back foot. I like you're 33 and your back foot's just not working the same, Richard. So it was a lot. That's the part I find the hardest. It's just getting that fitness back again. And you sort of expected that you were of yourself. You wanted to dance as good as you were dancing when you were 21, but it's not really practical, Mm -hmm. you know? Okay. So, you know, we talked a little bit about you getting, making the decision to take your teacher's exam and then later on your adjudicator's exam. Now, somewhere down the line, you decided to become a great examiner. What was that process like? Well, the grading examiner, to become a grading examiner, you have to be like uh, 10 years an adjudicator with Uncogoil and have three qualified TCRGs or else 15 years uh, an adjudicator. So it's just the next progression. Mm-hmm. And the grade, the grade exams, I actually enjoy doing them because you're, you get to talk to the children. You, you know, it's more intimate the you're not judging them on like a competition you can have your conversation ask them their questions and uh, I find it more enjoyable and you can help them and give them advice and some like constructive criticism when we tips you've done this well or you know you could improve on this I actually enjoy the great exams more than actually adjudicating competitions <laughs> It's, okay. it's lovely to see the children and their personalities and they're coming in and they're all nervous. And then with them talking to them for a few minutes, you, you can see them settling down, you know. So, okay. no, I love the exams. Sinead, what are you looking for when dancers come out at, at a fesh, whether it's a local fesh or a championship or a major? What are you looking for? Well... I um my main thing when I'm adjudicating is timing. Mm-hmm. To me, if you don't have timing, it's it's like it's like singing. If you can't keep in time to the music, forget it. You know that to me, that's the main point: timing and then rhythm, and then comes like their carriage and the placement of their feet. But t- timing is my main issue. If they lost time. I'm like, my head's going to get them back on time again. You know, I think that's most important to try and get that drummed into a child. They listen to the music. You dance to the music. The music isn't playing to your speed, you know. Right. That, that's the main thing. And a lot of people will say to me, if I'm adjudicating, they see I am sitting and then the next thing they'll see is Sinead doing this and I'm listening. <laughs> they know they go, oh, even the dancers, they go, if I see you doing that with their ear, I'm going, oh, did I miss that click or was I off time? <laughs> uh, but then again, at that all stems down, Richard, from the way we were trained. Right. You know, it was just drummed into us, you know, your timing, yeah. your rhythm, your carriage, 
you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So <clears throat> when you're when you're working with your own dancers that may decide they want to become a teacher, what do you do with them differently when they take that track than what you do if they're taking a competitive track? Well, I'm actually in the middle of training someone now again okay. for uh, the teacher's exam. And I take them right back. We go right back to the basics because they have to have their steps for every grade. Every dance, you feel beginner A, B, C, pre-open, open. So we cover lead rounds, side steps, a step, each grade, and then all your traditionals, first, second parts. I take them right back to the very beginning and I we cover everything and I get them to write their steps out as I say it. And in the way I in the it's like a le- learning a language, Richard. Mm-hmm. I get them to write it out in the way that I would say it. And file, poly pockets, everything. It's that's their Bible. That's what they have to carry, and they have to have that perfected. And then the set dances, and I sit and do music exams with them, written papers, samples, because Mary did the same with us. She always brought us round to the house, sat round the kitchen table, doing exams, test papers. And I always say, if you're not prepared, you're not going down to do that exam because I wouldn't let you go down half prepared. Mm-hmm. I think sometimes I can be over the top, but like we started in the end of June for an exam next June. I go, I don't want come Christmas, major panic set. No, I said, I don't deal with major panic. We do it now. We have all your steps, all your traditionals, all your set dances done now. And then we start practicing the teaching, the breaking down and the teacher. So it's completely different from teaching your class. It's com- it's teacher training, completely different, Richard. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's a different ball game completely. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think in, in an ideal world, that's exactly how teachers should be trained. If they have that, their teacher that's willing to take them under the arm and say, here's what we're going to do. Yeah. I didn't have that. A lot of people I know didn't have that. So it's very valuable for people who do have that. Cause it's, I'll be honest with you. It's really hard to self-motivate, especially when you're older, yeah. <laughs> you yeah, know, uh-huh. sometimes you need yeah. someone to just kick you in the rear end and say, you, you have to stop what you're doing and, and make sure you're practicing. Yeah. You know? Now I have well, friends I do. that do that, but uh, it'd be nice to have someone here. to do that. So. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I would say right now, next week, you need to have, this, this, and this off. And then I'm going to randomly say, right, dance me now a beginner C-step in the light jig. Dance me the second set of the job of journey work. Dance me. And I just fire it at them, you know, and they have to think on their feet. I said, because that's what it's going to be like. Right. You know, I said, you haven't time to go, oh, oh I can't think on this, you know. I said, and if you keep doing it and doing it and doing it, it's just going to come automatic to you. Mm-hmm. That's true. Yeah. Uh, some of the highlights of your teaching career so far, go, go through a couple of, of things that, that you take to you to this day, things that you're really proud of, uh, as far as what you've accomplished out there on your own. Well, I was always, I loved teaching figure dancing. And I loved having my teams go down and competing at the Ulster Championships, competing at the All-Irelands then. Uh, I remember having a composed dance, uh, got second in the All Ireland. They just missed one and a half by two points or something. And those children, as I said to you, I went out to the country to teach. It was like they won the Sam Maguire Cup for the Gaelic. They just thought, you know, this was just meant so much to these children. And a, another thing that I'm actually very proud of is that. Four of of, um, my past pupils, I've put them through their teacher's exam. And they weren't from the city here at all. They were were from out in County Derry where they didn't really have a lot of dancing and a lot of, they actually had to travel into the town to be able to go out at night. And, you know, there wasn't a lot of entertainment and sports stuff for them to do. But those girls... Kept, were committed to their dancing 
and I put them, trained them for their teacher's exam. And they're actually teaching now out in the areas where I used to teach them. I, you know, gave them them areas. Now you continue on, mm-hmm. you know, so that, like it makes me feel good. And it makes me feel like, well, you know, Mary would be proud. She trained us and we've all gone out now and we're continuing on, you know, mm-hmm. and passing on like her legacy, you know, the, the love of dancing. To me, I think that's really important. You have to love what you're doing. Oh, absolutely. I completely agree with you yeah. there. Um, yeah. Honor the traditions that were passed on to you, for sure. Are there yeah. any things that Mary would have said, maybe she had a quote or maybe it was something that she would always say that you recall that maybe you find yourself saying or thinking about? What? A vice in the back of my head? <laughs> <laughs> And when we were younger, we used to believe her, you know, we used to be looking, you know, if she was teaching and she was looking some way, and especially if there was boys in the class, and they would have been then maybe if she had her back turned looking some other way, they would start carrying on. And like, we really believed she did because she knew exactly what they were doing. And she would turn around, she said, I have eyes in the back of my head. I know what you're doing. <laughs> you know? And, and as well as that, you know, if there was a group of us up dancing, and we used to play, we used to play tag, you know, tapping one another, going around, dancing, thinking we were getting away with it. And she would have always, you know, caught you. But then when I found, when I started teaching my own class, I was actually saying the same things. You know, I have eyes in the back of my head. Or you're catching playing tag and I go, I know what you're doing. Because I did it myself, you know, <laughs> and you just sort of laugh. And you go, "Oh, I'm beginning to sound like her." <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. definitely, <laughs> absolutely. So, how did COVID affect you guys? Oh, COVID was very difficult, very difficult. Um, all the halls, and especially if you were teaching in like a council hall, they had everything closed down. The Gaelic halls where a lot of teachers would teach in the schools classes just basically stopped and it was all online on zoom mm-hmm. so that was very difficult like for two years you were trying you were sitting like this online and you were maybe had a child here and i remember like there was one family there was two children in it so i was having them on and there was one dancing, an older one, but the younger one then, I could see her swinging off the sofa at the side, you know, and I'm going, this, this is really a struggle here, you know. Yeah. But she sort of knew, you say, I'm far enough away from you, Sinead, so I can, you know, just be idle over here. And the other older sister's very serious, and she was dancing away. And the next thing I would see this leg or this arm come and swinging, you know. So it took a wee while when we got back into class, to try and pull the children back up again. Do you know, right. they were freaking and stuff at at, at 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 big time. But it's nice now to see now teams have started back. Now the the world figure dancing's on this weekend now. So that, I'd say that's lovely. They try and, teachers have to try and just build up their classes again, Richard. It's mm-hmm. very hard. And there's a lot of children too, I find now, when we get back into facious and the competition, they must sort of progressing through certain grades. You know, children were still sort of at, in beginner A and beginner B where they didn't have the competitions. They actually should be now like pre-open dancers at this stage mm-hmm. if they had a had competition for those two years. Mm-hmm. You know, and that has been hard as well. It's hard on the children. You know, once now they've sort of hit nine and ten and they were like seven the last time that they had a fish. Right. You know, and they've missed out on progressing through the grades to be able to move on. Mm -hmm. No, that's true. Yeah, Yeah, definitely would mess you up. Yeah. 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 So it's just taking time now to try and build it all back up again. You know. Right. Have you, so have you seen the numbers return back to where they used to be or they still have a ways to go? Oh, no, the numbers, I, I possibly in certain areas, but now in the north, the numbers are, numbers are very big. Now, because uh, we got back doing facias now this year, and I run a facia every March for the neonatal unit. And we had 
oh something like 700 dancers wow entered yeah you know and that was march and i was thinking they were, they were from london they were from scotland they came from dublin you know but a lot of them the majority of them was from the north and those that were were really dedicated to their dancing well they kept practicing at home you know the standard didn't really slip an awful lot you know those that was really dedicated were still up there at the worlds this year okay you know as I was adjudicating, I knew exactly, you know, they were still, and it was all, God, this is great to get yeah. back to see dancing again, right. you know? Right. Mm -hmm. So, but I think, right. sorry, Richard. Oh, no, that's okay. Uh, Sinead, if you, if someone's listening to this video, besides myself, who might be uh, <laughs> preparing for a teacher's exam or thinking about maybe one day sitting an exam, uh, ideally for Kogal, but it could be for any, any other organization. It's a similar prep. What would your advice be to them to, to keep them on track? When, as we know, especially when you're older, it's so easy to get off track. I, I think anybody that's doing, going to do their teacher's exam, they have to be totally committed, Richard. Yeah. And I know it's very difficult when they're older, especially ones that has just maybe came from university and they're used to going out, they have to commit to work it as two years solid work mm -hmm. there's no other way around it if you're going to be successful in that exam uh it is a very very tough exam it's very nerve-wracking i always said to my girls i can't describe this exam for you you you'll understand when you've done it <laughs> but there is no describing what it is actually like and i have sisters that went to university and did their degrees and this is it was way more difficult because they'd never go back again, you know, mm -hmm. but um, no, they have to prepare two years, solid hard work. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's what you have to do, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on it. I'm working on it. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I'll be keeping tabs. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. See, that, that's what that 17 years of wandering around in the wilderness has helped. I, I, I'm not starting from scratch, so that has helped me a little bit. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, uh, for people who, again, another scenario here, uh, people who may be watching this, that maybe they've been teaching for a while, and they hit the struggles that a lot of teachers, we all go through different struggles and challenges. Um, maybe they're even thinking about hanging it up. What would your what would your advice be to them to maybe keep keep going, give it another shot? I um it's, it's up to each individual, Richard. It depends on what their personal circumstances are right. as well and why they intend to give it up. Um I've had friends that really rebuilt their school again. And I feel a lot of the teachers now are actually after COVID having to try and do that. But I think a lot depends on, on each person's individual circumstances. Mm -hmm. But I always like to think that they might stop, if they stop teaching, they still stay in touch. They, they don't cut themselves out of the loop completely. You know, they would still maybe attend their branch meetings or come to facious and keep in contact because you never know someday, like they might decide that they want to come back. Right. Or, you know, just, I, I would always say, stay in touch. You never know. Mm -hmm. and I always hate to see somebody go, you know, giving it up and completely and cutting themselves off. Right. No, I agree with you completely there. Yeah. Um, and I guess in conclusion, Sinead, all of your experiences from the time you started to where you're at now, what do you think has helped you the most to become uh, to, to stick it out all this all, all these many years and being successful as you are um i think it's has just basically been family support mm -hmm. you know i have a lot of support like as i said to you i have three children uh three well they're growing up men now so they are uh but my three children were five three and a baby and i still went to dancing class so i have a very supportive husband you know, who just, and I think you need that support. Even my brothers, sisters, my mother, who's still, she's 81 now and has a great love of dancing. You know, you went to dancing. If there was any problems, the children had to be looked after. She was quite willing to look after them. 
she would come out and help. So I think it's your family network. You have to have that support. And I have I have great support. And because the family is all into the dancing. My husband was never into the dancing. Mm-hmm. He, ne- he never seen me dance in his life. But when he met me, it was this, well, sure, that's what you do. You know, that's what keeps you happy. And you've been doing it for years. And he has supported me. That's good. Still does. Still does. I'm going to Florida now in November. So I am. So <laughs> he just goes, well, so that's what you do. I'm going over to do grade exams and adjudicate. So okay. I'm looking forward to that. Right. Well, very good. Well, Sinead, I'm glad you came on and shared some of those valuable experiences with us. And uh, I wish you all the best and everything you've got going on in Irish dancing in the future. Thank you, Richard. And I wish you all the best, too, if you do your exam. Thank you.